And for our very last talk of today, it's got an interesting talk title that Kubernetes is doomed. So I'm quite excited to find out how Kubernetes is doomed. And I'm really delighted to welcome Anne Curry to the stage. Hey, Anne. Hello. <laughs> how are you, Paula? I am very well. It's been an excellent day so far, and I'm so excited to hear your talk. <laughs> well, it's lovely to see you. And I'm sure it would be almost as lovely to see everybody else if I could see them. <laughs> one day, one day we'll all be back in person again. Uh, right, so I'm going to share my uh, application. Uh, my screen contents, great. Nope, okie doke. Right, and you can, can you see me all, oh, see me okay? I'm just going to switch to my presentation. Right, so can you see me okay? Am I good to go? I can see your face. I can only see a black screen next to it though. Uh, okay, let me, uh, let me, it does it sometimes. I'm quite surprised it's not offering me the ability to, um, uh, to just, no, that's no use. Um, I'll try and do a new share. Share my entire screen. I can see something. Share, can you see that? Yes, yes indeed. Excellent, All right. Sometimes, sometimes Zoom, Zoom doesn't work very well with Chromebooks, so. Um, uh, yeah. You can see my screen now, full screen? Yes, indeed. Excellent. Good, 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 good. Right. Uh, oh, right. So it's about time for me to kick off. Should I kick off yet or should I give it another minute? Go, go ahead. We're live. Okay. We're live. <laughs> no swearing. <laughs> right. Uh, well, my name is Anne Curry and I have been in the tech industry for, depressingly enough, nearly 30 years now. Uh, and I was, I used to work on high performance C backend servers. Uh, these days I do something a little bit different and we'll talk, to, talk <laughs> I'll mention that later in the talk. But uh, my aim today is to talk to you about the direction of travel of um, operations and architecture. What I think will, will be affecting us in the next decade, in the next 10 years. <clears throat> now, um, the cloud. But don't worry, don't panic. I'm not about to say it's the cloud because that would be crazy talk. The cloud is what completely revolutionized architecture and operations in the past 10 years. But I don't think that that in and of itself, not, not directly, is what's going to be pushing our direction of travel in the next decade. I think in the next day, decade, it's all going to be about the climate. And it's not and also, don't worry, I'm not about to tell you that this is that your know, data center is all about to burn to the ground or be washed away to the sea or anything like that. Um, hopefully, within the next 10 years, that's, that won't happen. But what will happen, what we know will happen in the next 10 years and will have a significant effect on us, is, the, is how the cloud is architecturally responding to climate change and the effects of climate. Because for the past five years or so, I've been involved in campaigns to move the cloud over to sustainable hosting. Uh, and in 2020, we had an amazing, uh, an amazing step forward in that, which I'd, I'd, I'd love to say win, but let's face it, it's not. Jeff Bezos woke up one morning and decided he was going to do it, and it had absolutely nothing to do with anybody else. But um, uh, in 2020, all of the major cloud providers committed to being carbon zero by 2030, so um, in, now in nine years time. And this isn't some kind of airy fairy, half-assed uh, carbon neutral commitment because uh, they're all, they're, most of them are already there already. So Google Cloud has been carbon neutral since 2007, which is an extraordinarily long time. Uh, Azure, we're a bit later, but they've been, they've been carbon neutral since 2014. <laughs> uh, AWS, they're still not carbon neutral. They are in some regions. They're uh, carbon neutral in Ireland, in Frankfurt, Canada, and Oregon. Uh, so if you want to be carbon neutral now, that's where you should be hosting. But uh, they have nonetheless joined everybody else in committing to be carbon zero by 2030. 
And say carbon zero is a much, much harder target to meet. You can be, in many ways, carbon neutral just means you're tracking what carbon you're emitting and then you're paying for offsets of one form or another. Uh, and that's, it's nice that you're doing the tracking and it's nice that you're willing to shell out a little bit of money to, to buy the offsets, but offsets are not that useful. What we actually need in the long run is a commitment to not emit any carbon as a result of your operations. So uh, carbon zero is that commitment. No carbon from uh, electricity and no carbon from uh, hardware production. And that is a ridiculously difficult goal. Uh, and I have to say, uh, in all the time that I was campaigning for this, and, and, and all of us, a lot of us were campaigning for this, I think we, we were over, we were ridiculously naive. Uh, we all thought that once the cloud committed to be carbon zero, if you were running on the cloud, then you would just become carbon zero. It would become carbon zero underneath you and you wouldn't have to do anything. And I was thinking that was fantastic, but that was in retrospect, completely foolish of me because when you start look, to look into how they're doing it and what they're having to do, you realize that I don't think they're gonna be able to do it without our help, without us getting involved, without changing the way that we do things as well. Uh, and, and why I think that is, is the subject of the next part of my talk, which is, which is what they're doing and why I don't think that in and of itself, they can do it. So their first step, and this is really good. I can't, I can't criticize them for doing this. Their first step is that they have spent huge amounts of money getting more renewables into the, into the national grids. So they've put shed loads of money into um, either building um, wind farms, solar farms themselves, and piping the, the power directly into their own data centers. But more commonly, they have signed up to be guaranteed purchases of power coming from third party um, wind farms and, and solar farms, either directly with the with the companies building those farms or with the with the with the local grids. Uh, to, uh, and they've spent a lot of money on this. So over the past decade, uh, Google has commonly been the biggest non-governmental purchaser of renewable power in the world. Uh, last year, it was Ada, it was Amazon, and that's probably hardly surprising because, as I said, Google have been doing this for years. And Amazon have suddenly woken up and decided that they need to do it as well. And so they're, they're chucking in, they're having to chuck in huge amounts of money. And, and this is great because a few years ago, I think when I used to talk about this, people's most common objection was, well, if the clouds decide that they're all going to be uh, the run on, on um, sustainable power, then all they're going to do is suck all the sustainable power out of the grids and there won't be any for anybody else. And it's, you know, there's, it's a zero sum game. It's, we haven't improved things at all. But in fact, that's not what they're doing. They're, they are guaranteeing that more renewable power goes into the system. So that's all great. That's all good. And I kind of, in my old dream, my old dream world where I was I'm feeling very positive about this, I thought that would be all that was required. Um, but that was really because I hadn't properly thought things through. Because there is a significant problem with the renewable power. Well, some renewable power. Uh, there's a significant problem with wind and solar. And that is that sometimes it rains. Sometimes it's even the night. Wind and solar, sometimes it's not windy. Wind and solar are naturally variable available, variably available power sources. They are not pumping out power to you all the time. Uh, you'll, there'll be times when there's tons of power and times when there is no power or very little power. Now, and that isn't the way that data centers work. Most data centers need power all the time. Your applications mostly need to run all the time. And there are places where you could have data centers where that would be the case and the power would still be renewable. I mean, obviously, if you're running, it's, it's, the, reason why we, it's the reason why we still have fossil fuels after all of these years. And we're known for you know, half a century that's uh, about climate change and about the greenhouse gas effects. But um, fossil fuels are so damn good uh, they are reliable, they're cheap, they're easy to transport. There's, there's a reason, it's not craziness that we've, we've been so reluctant about it, it, in moving to, to renewable power, so, uh, 
power sources. Um, and there are places in the world where you won't have to worry so much about this. There are places where you could put your data center where you would have renewable uh, power that was reliable. So maybe you could be in France where they've got loads of nuclear power. Uh, or you could be in Iceland where they've got loads of geothermal, or you could be in Canada where they've got loads of hydro. But that isn't everywhere, and that isn't where most data centers are, because let's face it, most data centers are in the, the east coast of the USA. So there is, there's always, there is going to be a huge problem with reliable sourcing of power for data centers. Now, the way that climate activists have been pushing to handle this for, for many years, and I tend to agree with them, I think this is a very sensible way of doing it, is using variable pricing for electricity. So at times when there's tons of it because the sun's shining and the wind's blowing, then power is extremely cheap, maybe even free. And at times when, when there isn't any, <laughs> there's very little renewable power available, and maybe carbon is having to be emitted to the atmosphere in order to provide any power at all, then that power should be incredibly expensive. And I think that's kind of inevitable because um, I'm, I'm not one of these um, uh, communist climate activists. I think that capitalism works quite well, but it has to be incentivized. If, if, we, if the government subsidized, uh, subsidizes bad energy production, then there's, there's no reason why anyone should do anything about it. There's no reason why we should start to adapt to a world of variable power. So I really hope, and I think that it will be the case that we'll get variable uh, electricity pricing more widely. They have it in Spain at the moment, but that, that's, that's kind of the, the, the forerunner of this kind of thing. So it will be useful, it'll be helpful. We think it's inevitably coming um, but it's probably not going to solve absolutely, well, it probably will solve things for us in the long run, but we, it won't just transparently solve it for us. It'll incentivize to make, incentivize us to make the kind of operational and architectural changes that we'll need to make to take advantage of variable electricity pricing. So let's step back for a moment and, um, and, and just remind ourselves about what the cloud providers have signed up to, absolutely actively signed up to for uh, 2030. And what that means that they've signed us up to because we are all fairly locked into the cloud uh, and that's only gonna become more so over the next 10 years. Uh, so what they do, we're doing. Uh, and, and it's a good, and in this case, it's a really good thing to do. And I, so I can't object to it, but I don't think it's gonna be um, zero cost for us. I don't think we're just gonna, it's just gonna happen without us having to worry about it. So they've signed up to zero carbon emitted uh, as part of the generation of electricity that is used in their data centers. Uh, they've also signed up to reducing embodied carbon in the hardware that runs in their data centers. And that generally means that they'll have to make hardware last a lot longer and use it better. And all of these commitments are generally for most of their data centers on top of variable availability power. So from solar, from wind, because that really is the, work, the, the workhorse. I would personally, I would love it if we were, if we'd all gone to nuclear and we just didn't have to worry about all this kind of stuff, but we didn't and we're not likely to for quite some time. So I think we have to grok that the world that we're in is one in which that, power will be variably available. Uh, I know that there's loads of storage, everybody's desperate for storage, but all of the storage, um, all of the storage solutions at the moment are suboptimal, they're expensive. Um, they're not, they, they're not a like for like replacement for um, oil. Uh, even, even hydrogen, which is kind of the, the that Exxon and Shell would like to believe was the like for like replacement for oil is not as good. It will cost more. So uh, I think we have to accept that we're going to be handling some variable av availability of power. So how, how are, I mean, I wonder how much uh, they've thought about this, really thought this through before they committed to the zero carbon um, uh, deadline uh, last year. Some of them cer certainly had, Google certainly had, but I'm seeing a lot of activity now that suggests so that, that they've upped their game a little bit and they're trying a little bit harder on this. So let's look first at Google who released an interesting paper on what their 
next, uh, apart from buying a whole load of uh, renewable power, what their, their next steps would be in actually using that renewable power and meeting their 2030 commitments. So um, they produced a very interesting paper, I think it came out in June or July, uh, about the next generation of scheduling and programmatic orchestration. Now, we, this is a Kubernetes conference, so we all know that Google have been the uh, kings and queens of programmatic orchestration, the, the forerunner to uh, Kubernetes. And they've used it to physically shift encapsulate tasks around in their data centers to increase server density and use um, less energy to do the same work, which is all great for, um, for climate change. It's all great for uh, reducing the amount of uh, bad energy that you're putting into the atmosphere, um, bad energy that you're uh, using and, and, and as a result, carbon goes into the atmosphere. But it's not enough. We need to actually have a bit of a paradigm, another paradigm shift in how we do this. And at their next stage, the thing they're trialing at the moment is more, um, uh, is, is the trying harder to shift tasks in time. And they call this temporal displacement. Uh, and because um, they are Googlers and they do like their sci fi. Uh, and it's interesting because what they're doing is in many ways, very similar and just an extension of what they've done in the past, what's, what their schedulers and their, and their old um, programmatic orchestration did. And in some ways, it's the complete opposite. So uh, the similarity is it requires encapsulated tasks that are well labeled and they move them around. They just happen to be moving them in time rather than just in, in location. So, you know, we live in a 4D world, why not? But in some ways, it's the exact opposite of what they were doing, because what they were doing before was they were trying to pack uh, their workloads onto machines as tightly as possible so that those machines were maximally used. They got really high server density, really high utilization. And that meant everything was more efficient. And it meant that you got more out of your machine during its lifetime. So you, you didn't use up too much electricity and your hardware lasted longer. The aim of the new thing of temporal displacement is to actually reduce uh, server density at certain times or reduce the, the amount of work that you're doing at certain times of the day when there's no green power available to reduce the amount of work you're doing and actively potentially turn machines off. So in many ways, the opposite of what they were doing. But the idea is less uh, energy used when there's no good energy to use. Now, there are various things that they need in order to accomplish this. So, as I said, they need good orchestrators, which they've got, uh, schedulers, which they've got, the encapsulated tasks, which they've got, which is all good. But you also need uh, tasks that are uh, lower priority and not as urgent, that don't have quite as high an SLA um, on uh, as, as a dropped an SLA on when they run. They don't have to be run immediately. They can be delayed, deferred. They can be de delayed until the sun comes up. And um, they have that, but we don't always have that. So that's one of the things that they pointed out in this in this paper is that uh, they can run this and they can get this to work. And, and actually, that they um, oh, I'll, I'll put links to the paper in my Twitter feed. So. You can have a read of it if you want, but uh, their, their initial results are a bit rubbish. But as they point out, it's their first go and they expect it to get better. And we hear in the grapevine that the results are getting much, much better as they move on, as they move forward. Um, but they can only run all of this on their own workloads. They can't run it on the Google Cloud. And the reason is that within their own workloads, they know a lot about those workloads. They know what, which ones can be deferred. They know an awful lot about, uh, a, a, about how urgent they are. But when you move to, you, when they look at the VMs in the Google Cloud, those are just black boxes. They have no idea what they can defer. So they can't do any of this clever stuff on that. And that is going to be an issue because this temporal displacement is going to be required if we're going to handle variable power. So is there any is there anything that that does do that for us that allows us to encapsulate tasks and indicate that we don't really mind if they get deferred a bit? 
Well, um, if you look at the Amazon sustainability blog at the moment, and, and it's giving guidance on, on how people should write more sustainable code in the future, they're pushing spot instances quite heavily. And I would tend to think that that's a very good idea. So a spot instance, I mean, everybody knows what a spot instance is, you've, you've wrapped your application uh, uh, in, in effectively in an, in an AWS spot instance, and you said run it when you got the chance. That gives AWS and AWS's orchestrators and, um, uh, and schedulers the chance to uh, balance that and, and run it when they can and, and take a, uh, account of everything else that's going on in the system. So their schedulers have more information than your local Kubernetes scheduler would do. Uh, and uh, you've told it that you've given a lot of information about that task. You said, look, I don't mind when it runs, just make sure it runs at some point. And as a result of that, you're paying a lot less money. And, and that reflects the fact that actually these spot instances <coughs> help AWS and the other providers who also provide them um, to make their systems more efficient and it cuts the cost for them. It has a, 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 less, a lower marginal, marginal cost. Uh, everything I'm talking about, it, it's good to us in a certain, it, it's good up to a certain point, but it's not perfect. So um, it, it causes problems with hardware, but um, those are other problems that we'll hope that Google fix. And that at some point, hopefully I'll talk to you about what they did to fix them. Uh, I won't worry them too much about uh, too much about this now. So given, given that I've told you that Google and, and Amazon and, and uh, Azure have an awful lot of work to do, but the way that they are attempting to do it is using programmatic infrastructure and scheduling, it seems a little, a little perverse for me to say that Kubernetes is doomed, given that Kubernetes is a programmatic orchestrator with scheduling. Um, but I think there are some, there are a couple of really quite terminal problems with Kubernetes at the moment when it comes to this new world of advanced um, temporal shifting uh, scheduling. The one of them, this is potentially not even the main one, is, is that there is not enough variety of tasks. So if you're running uh, Kubernetes, the likelihood is you're using it to manage an enterprise's worth of workloads. And Google, Google themselves point out in their paper that that isn't really enough tasks to, to get really good utilization, to get the, the efficiency up to the level that they need in order to meet this zero carbon um, deadline is uh, they need re they need massive variety of tasks, of task sizes, task priorities, task urgencies, and you just don't have that. So that's a bit of a problem. Your workloads are probably not labeled enough. You probably don't have enough higher priority and low priority workloads anyway, but even if you do, they're not sufficiently labeled. And, um, uh, but, mm, the first one will probably be very hard to fix. The second one is fixable, especially as you've got 10 years to do it. The third one is totally fixable, but you're going to need to start demanding it. Kubernetes has around it and associated with it a lot of tools that are high priority, that run all the time, like your service mesh, that just burn too much CPU. Uh, a lot of those tools, they are too inefficient. And if a tool is going to be running all the time, uh, as, as these tools necess by necessity have to do, those tools are gonna have to be super efficient. And at the moment that has not been a requirement, but it will be over the next 10 years, it's gonna become an absolute requirement. And you need to be pushing back to your suppliers and saying, okay, I want service meshes that are a lot more efficient than the ones that are being offered to me now. There is a reason why the cloud providers do not run the commercial uh, service meshes. They are just not good enough. They're not efficient enough. Uh, to, to meet these deadlines and just meet these goals. So going uh, away from this, uh, away from this talk and, and going back to work, what do I think you should be thinking about? And you've got time, you've got years on this, but it's, it's a big change and we need to be preparing for it. Um, you need to be architecting, architecturally thinking in terms of high and low priority tasks. And I'm using that literally high and low priority tasks, not high and low importance tasks. Um, it, it, it's a classic of management that you have uh, important tasks and urgent tasks and that they are not the same thing. 
Um, just because a task is low priority, it's not urgent, doesn't mean it's not important. It might be your most important task, but you need to split out what's urgent and what's not urgent. Um, because that's going to be utterly required in a world of variable availability power. Um, embrace spot instances, because it, with Kubernetes, you can be managing spot instances as well as your normal Kubernetes workloads. Have a go at that. Make sure that you can do that and encourage your developers to start thinking in terms of designing, architecting to use spot instances. Because with a spot instance, it's it's they, they can be incredibly efficient and they can be used by the cloud providers to, to, to help them move towards those, those um, zero carbon goals in a way that stuff that's that you're managing yourself, that they can never they can never do that as well. Um, so as a distributed systems work well with if you're splitting tasks out. If you are carving carving microservices off your monolith, start thinking in terms of, can you carve off uh, applications that have a consistent SLA associated with them? In the Right now, spots are the most obvious, but I think there will be more sophisticated spots in the future that, that maybe, um, th that will allow you to say, well, I need this to run within the next hour, or I need this to run three times a day. Um, a bit of a, a, a halfway house between spots at the moment and systems that, that you just have entirely under your own control. Um, think about what regions, some regions are much more uh, energy, have much more sustainable energy in them than, than others. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Target your efficiency improvements at things that have to, that are urgent, that you're gonna have to run like that. That's where you really need those efficiency improvements. And efficiency improvements are a pain in the neck and take ages. And um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, so so target them or the stuff that you can't stick in a spot because if you can stick it in a spot, it doesn't need the efficiency improvement as much. Uh, and make sure you're using the edge and devices. And, and uh, if you're gonna be lacking power, those devices have power. If they don't have power, then they won't be logging into your system. So, Almost by def definition, the device has some power to work with. You can always fall over to using that, fail over to using that if, if you need to. But you'll have to think carefully about how you achieve that for your particular applications. Uh, and uh, as a little um, uh, a little thought experiment for, for you to, to, to be thinking about or for you to be setting for your development team, could you run 90% of your global CPU usage on spots? Now, that might seem like a crazy thing for me to suggest. And, and, and actually, CPU usage and energy usage are, uh, are a very good, um, uh, it's a good rule of thumb that your CPU usage and your energy usage are pretty much the same kind of thing. You might think that's crazy talk, I couldn't possibly do that. But have a think about it, because actually there are quite a, there are several ways that you could do that uh, on almost any system. Uh, it's the kind of thing we used to do in the 90s when we didn't have any uh, any CPU or memory or anything else. We used to come up with cunning schemes for doing these kind of things. And and they do work quite well. They are more effort and you do have to think about them. But, you know, it's quite a fun thing to think about crazy stuff like that. And uh, because actually in 10 years time, that is the situation you'll be in. <laughs> I'm afraid um, unless we completely discover some amazing new storage uh, technology during that time, which I think is unlikely. Um, so that's that's your main takeaway from this. The second takeaway is uh, my job these days, as well as talking at conferences and doing techie things. I am a science fiction writer, a speculative fiction writer, and uh, to celebrate this conference today, my first book, Utopia Five, is on is available for free download today. Today only. So uh, go away, Google Utopia Five on uh, Amazon and fill your boots, uh, get yourself a free copy. So yes, that is uh, my talk. So Paula. That's brilliant. Thanks, Anne. I'll do a quick, a quick recommendation for the book as well, because I've read it. It's very good. Uh, I'm working my way through the rest of the series. So uh, I'm very excited. Uh, we hadn't got any questions posted in the Slack channel, but I did have one question, so I'll just ask my own question. You mentioned about efficiency of tools, and you mm. specifically called out service meshes as being pretty inefficient. Mm. If I'm looking at the CNCF landscape in which there are many, 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 many tools, how would I know 
which ones are the more efficient? Is there any way of knowing just by looking or is there some, some place I can check? No, there isn't. Although it is one of the things that, so I'm involved in the Green Software Foundation, the, the Microsoft and Linux Foundation um, uh, group to start giving advice on, on how to write greener software and, and how to operate greener software. And this is one of the things we'll be looking into. So what's, nice. what should you be doing? You know, what's putting, putting a little bit of pressure on the, uh, on the writers of these tools to make sure that they are more energy efficient in the future. It would be interesting if there was, if we got to the point where there was some kind of a score and you could, you could choose your tool based on its kind of green credentials would be quite, would be quite an interesting metric. Yes. Yeah. Like you choose your washing machine. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, mean, I think the Green Software Foundation is quite keen to do that. So uh, I think that that's interesting. Super. Well, thank you so much for your talk. It's been fantastic. Matt, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say to, to Anne's point about spot instances, um, it's worth noting that um, uh, at least up until fairly recently, I think the entirety of Yelp used to run on, on spot instances. So it is certainly possible for even large scale web scale um, applications to, uh, to do that. Well, that's very good. Yelp were ahead of their time there. Indeed. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Anne, then please post them in our, in our Slack channel. And thank you so much for joining. That was a great talk. Thank you very much for having me.